Um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce my friend Sophie Hellenick. Uh, you're probably all familiar with the Dos Equis commercial, where it's the most interesting man in the world. Yeah. Well, this is the most interesting woman that I've ever met. <laughs> um, Sophie and I uh, met in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, Dr. Feltus and I were in the lift line, and there was another guy, and there were three of us, and we had one room in the quad chair. And uh, how would I be so lucky that she was a single, and uh, all I had to do was try to fend off the other two guys for her attention. <laughs> um, she then proceeded to tell me, I, I haven't skied in 20 years, and uh, so you have to go a little slow for me. And I said, okay, don't worry about that, it's okay. And uh, she was the first one down the tree line. The rest of us were, <laughs> she says, oh, my technique's not so good. Uh, so that was, you know, my first inkling that she had quite a bit of talent. Um, Sophie is a uh, young kid who's quite an accomplished tennis player. In fact, I was looking up today that she, uh, when she was 12 years old, played against Emile, Emily uh, Marismo, is that how you pronounce her name? Mm -hmm. Yes, who won Wimbledon and the Australian Open. Wow. And I said, well, did you beat her? And she said, she was a year older than me, no, I didn't know. <laughs> um, Sophie then became a judo expert and uh, qualified for the French All-Star team, was quite successful when she was 14 and 16. Uh, and then at age, in the, her early 20s, she decided she wanted to become a champion at something, uh, and so she took up fencing. And in the first three months, uh, she qualified for the World Championships. And I said, well, how did you do? And she said, well, not that well. And she said, but the next year, you know, our team came in third. Because she got that sport down, so she gave up on that. Uh, Sophie came to uh, New York in 2004, uh, speaking no English, and went to work for Credit Lyonnais uh, as a mathematician, um, and was quite successful with that, evidently, and then she became a portfolio manager. Um, and in her spare time, she decided to take up rugby. Now, you know, you have a look at her. I, she doesn't look like a rugby player to me, but <laughs> evidently they did quite well. Um, in 2006, Sophie uh, was on vacation in Ecuador, and some of the people she was with said, we should go climb this mountain, which was the tallest uh, active volcano, I believe, in the world. Uh, which she did, but as she describes it to me, she showed up a little bit ill-prepared to climb this 20,000 foot mountain, and that she had a Rite Aid poncho as her equipment, uh, and so I guess her crewmates were helpful in outfitting her. Um, so that got her hooked on climbing um, and launched her career. Um, before she climbed Mount Everest, uh, she, as a warm-up, and to get her technical skills, she climbed five peaks in Bolivia that were between 18 and 20,000 feet in seven days, which uh, I'm still trying to get up Lantern Hill. <laughs> uh, and then in 2008, Sophie uh, summited Mount Everest. Uh, in the next couple of years, she did seven first ascents in Peru uh, and was recognized in the American Alpine Journal as being uh, quite unique uh, with those particular feats. Uh, in 2011, she climbed uh, K2, which is actually where she met her husband. Um, and for some of you, you might know in 2008, 11 people died climbing K2, and the statistic there is that one in four people perish. Uh, someplace I'm gonna leave off my bucket list, <laughs> but Sophie's gonna talk about that uh, tonight. Uh, she also then, that year, climbed what's called Broad Peak, which is a budding uh, K2. And she spent the next 80 out of 90 days uh, above uh, 15,000 feet. Um, and then climbed three more in that five-month period, climbing five of the top 12 peaks in the world in a five-month period. Um, she's also, since she's had a child, um, has taken to writing children's books, and she won the Creative Child Book of the Year this year, um, and the Mom's Choice Award. Um, so you can say that age 36, um, rather accomplished, and um, you know I can't wait to see what the next 15 years can be look like. But her motto is anything is possible, 
And uh, I think you'll be quite interested in her story. And after bragging her about her like this, I just want to tell you that she's afraid of cows. <laughs> with me. I'm absolutely delighted to share with you my Broad Peak and K2 story. It was one of the most challenging uh, adventures in my life. It was the ultimate taste, psychological and physical, speaking. So my motto uh, is everything is possible. I never limit myself to what I know, to what I should know, and what I should be doing. I always try to think beyond my comfort zone, do not hesitate to reinvent myself, and dare to do. In 2006, I did plan for and I see the world upside down. Because at the age, I found Everest. I was the youngest French uh, woman to climb Mount Everest. So, after I climbed Mount Everest, I wanted to go back to climb another 8,000 meter. The game can be really tough and anything can happen at any moment. The last thing you want is being stuck in a situation that you are totally unprepared, but without any skills. So, I spent the last two years, so from 2009 to 2010, to enhance my climbing I learned many different climbing types, including how to uh, work on mixed climbing, which is rock and ice, different types of stiffness, and I was able to uh, and I was able to uh, I was able to actually get the skill that I was that I could just climb whatever I want. I was even, I actually learned to read the mountain itself. I was lucky enough to have a mentor who would really try to challenge me in any way possible. For example, this one is like, Sophie, we're going to climb this mountain. You have to find a way. You have to find the best safe way. I'm like, all right, well, it doesn't, doesn't seem pretty safe to me and it seems pretty tough. But, Difficult doesn't mean impossible. Actually, if you look a little bit closer, then you're able to see a little bit more here. And that's the way we just get to the summit. And that why it was important, it's because on those 8,000 meters, which is 26,000 feet, you have to be able not only to, you have to react well, but as well to be able to be creative and know how to find another route if necessary. So all this training took about two years, then I was ready. 2011, I came up with this challenge of climbing five peaks above 8,000 meters in five months. It's never been done by any woman before, um, but I was feeling really comfortable with it because I was feeling prepared to the unexpected. So I start my challenge by climbing Shouyu, which is in Tibet, China. It's the sixth highest peak in the world. Two weeks later, I went to Nepal and I saw Mit Lhotse, which is the fourth highest peak in the world. Those two climbs were very important for me because it really allowed to appreciate my physical and mental strengths, but as well to appreciate how uh, my ability to, to tolerate uh, attitude, high attitude. Then I'm back to Kathmandu. I'm ready to go to climb Broad Peak and Ketu, they're both uh, big child mountains in Pakistan. And I I went to see my friend Lagba, he was going to climb K2, and I tried to convince him to climb Broad Peak with me. After some reflection, he actually accepted. We eventually climbed Broad Peak together and K2. 
It's a big deal because when you climb one mountain, it takes so much out of you. It's so demanding. So you take the risk to spend too much energy in this in these first mountains to run out of gas to climb your second mountain. So when you go to when you arrive to Islamabad, you're not remotely close to road ticket, which is gonna be my first one. You have to drive for two days on the Karakoram Karakor Highway, which is like that. Then you have to drive one day on the death road. <laughs> you have a major road full here, <laughs> very dangerous. And then you have to trek 100 kilometers. <coughs> Initially, you start your trek at about 4,000 feet. You can see some fields, and then as you go along, then no more fields, then you just have sand, rock, and a river. Then no more river, now you actually walk on a glacier. It's actually pretty tricky to not get lost in this glacier. You have those beautiful lake with milky water. You see the surrounding, you can see the mountains start getting higher and higher. Then you have to cross rivers, glacier rivers, and then I finally see for the first time road big. The very next day when we arrived at Road Big, we saw a summit window. A summit window is you have the weather forecast and the weather forecast predict good weather for 24 hours to 36 hours at the summit. Lakpa and I, we decided to go for the summit, which is extremely unusual because we, like all the climbers who just arrived like us at base camp, they're not even thinking going in this mountain for the next few days because you need to acclimatize. The acclimatization is a very long and tedious leapfrog process. You're going up during the day and down at night. You, can, you cannot rush it. You have to give enough time to your body to get exposed to altitude to boost your red cells. There's no shortcut. Lakpa and I were, were a little bit different. We actually have the ability, natural ability to Tolerate you know, altitude. It's our makeup. And we still have a little bit of acclimatization from our, from our previous time. So we decided to go for the summit. Going, from the, going for the summit means we're going to be the first one to actually be on the mountains. We're going to have to break the trail. Breaking the trail, as you can see, is very demanding. Every step comes. Demanding physically, time consuming. It takes a lot out of you. So whatever you think it's going to take five hours, you can literally triple it. So it takes 15 hours. We finally reach our camp too. And we were feeling good. We skipped camp one because we're feeling good, so we moved up. We have camp two. We are about like 19, 20,000 feet. And we are really feeling good, so we decided to keep going to the next step, camp three. It's about 23,000 feet. And here we go. My alpine climb start paying off. My skills are here. We did the whole thing in alpine style. We have to deal with rock, we have to deal with space, we have to deal with ice, we have to deal with steep snow. And it was okay. We think getting a little bit tired. Finally, almost at entry. But when you're at entry, just a feel of snow, well, you have to dig it. You have to dig your tent platform. So you have to be able to keep enough energy to actually um, set a safe spot for your tent. That is scheduled on the background. 
So we were still on that now with about 20, 22,000 feet. And we were still feeling really good. So we decided to go for the summit. We were going to the summit and then we got to the major windstorm. No, without any hesitation, we just run down. We went up to above 24,000 feet. Next thing you know, we're going back down to base camp at 15,000 feet. That's me going down. We did a good comb because you see that is actually the broad peak being snowed out by those high wind. On the way down, we, have, we saw like major avalanches. And then finally, we start seeing our base camp. You see the tents here? That's our base camp. After a few more days of waiting for good weather, we have a second opportunity to go for the summit. That time, we go to Camp 2, everything's good, then Camp 2 to Camp 3, we have a windstorm. But we had this feeling of if we were able to go above the windstorm, above the cloud, then it would be fine. We were right above the cloud, above about 21,000 feet, then no more windstorm. The thing is, as we were going up, the snow started getting deeper and deeper and softer up to, up to our knees. That's never a good sign. That's avalanche signs. Then we start looking around. We could see now. There's always no tent. We look, we look, we start digging, like we were avalanche dogs, we couldn't find any tent. Our tent just being wiped out by the avalanche. Mm -hmm. The weather, like the night start falling, we have to go down. We go down to, so our summit is cancelled. We go down to, to camp two, and then we go down to, camp, to base camp. The great thing when you're actually climbing, you have the unique opportunity to meet with the locals and understanding their culture. It's part of the deal. You even learn to be their language. You try to understand where they're coming from. That is me dancing, <laughs> improvising. <laughs> the very next day, actually, we just saw a semi window and I was back in the mountain with like that. <coughs> so that's how I came to. About 20,000 feet. And that's on the way of country. And now we're going up to about 23,000 feet. That is the view from our camp. That day, we're going to go for the summit again. Uh, I was pretty excited because our summit day should have been the 14th of July, which is a French national day. And I thought, oh, how cloud I would be. So you do actually come by night. And why summit days are important to plan by night for many reasons. First of all is the snow is better, it's consolidated, so therefore you have less avalanches. You have less chance of rockfall because the ice around the, the, the rock just make them link to each other. The snow itself, the consistency is better. And the most important thing is you need to be at the summit in the morning, because in the afternoon, the weather pattern changed. So in the ideal target, in every climber's mind, is try to reach a summit between 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And again, go down as fast as you can. So we did start at 9 p.m., shooting for 15 hours straight to the summit, and then about seven hours to go down. So when I'm talking about summit day, I'm talking about over 24 hours of climbing. The issue was on that day, we just had a lot of avalanches. Therefore, the snow was not prime, and it took us so, such a long time. And then I was getting colder and colder and colder to a point that I stopped. I could not feel my feet anymore. So I sit. Lakpa was behind me, he came over, and he's like, What's going on? I'm like, I cannot feel my feet anymore. He's like, Really? I was at the time almost at 20, above 25,000 feet. I removed my big boots, my sock, I was my feet naked. 
And we always carry a stove with us, which is crazy because every little thing is represent a certain weight and we don't want to carry extra weight because it means extra effort, extra energy, and we don't want that. So for us carrying the stuff, it's really like, you know, what's wrong with your type of reaction from other climbers. But for us was, well, you know, 24 hours, we just want just to, to keep our option if we need some water. But in our case, that time it was not for water. We literally turned off the stove to warm up my feet. I was naked feet, above 25,000 feet, and I was warming up my feet. And then I suddenly saw those, you know, those marks of frostbite, you know, this, this line of bra of my big toe. And then I started to see them swollen immediately. I put dry socks on, put back my big boots on, and went down straight to base camp to try to avoid to have them colder. <coughs> the way down, it was not as easy at the other time. This is not going to be extremely sticky. You see, we couldn't keep up. We tried to remove the snow, remove the snow, and we decided to just say, what the hell? They just use them as ski and just slide. So we are trying, we start sliding the hill. Look how my family we start seeing base camp. So I arrived at base camp and I just had a, and I happened to have only a frost frost nip, which is just the level before the actual frost bite. So after one week recovery, we had the on another opportunity of going for the summit. But that time, Lakpa said, Sufi, you know, I'm done. I don't have the energy anymore. You know, it's, uh, I cannot do it anymore. I'm going to move to K2. I'm like, okay, I, I, I understand. I'm still going to try it one more time because I still have it in me. But then I will meet you on K2. So it's like, okay. So we split up. And on that summit day, you have to see that it's not only me and Lagba. You have expeditions and many expeditions. So we end up on this massive summit push. We are about 40 people, 40 climbers with many different nationalities. Name it. Taiwanese, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, Canadian, American, even Ecuadorian. Um, and we all gather our effort because the thing is like we all know that to go to the summit not only one person can break up the trail, we have to make some rotation. So what was interesting to me in this picture is I have been on this mountain for over a month now. I know this mountain by heart, but not quite because I knew that with snow on it and ice on it. And as the time passed, there's no more snow, there's no more ice. The mountains just try drying up. So it's very interesting is the things, things change and things evolve. That we're on our way to country. Finally, we arrived to the South Pole. Among the 40 climbers who start with us, everybody start dropping, 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 and we end up 10 people on the South Pole. Three of them, uh, they were exhausted, they started seeing the exposure, we were having, we were about like seven hours, still to climb, they're like, no, we don't. You know, I'm, I'm not doing it. Unfortunately, one of them went just too far. The thing is, you have to understand is when somewhat easier in your head to keep going up and you have this idea of like, I'm gonna go for the summit. You, you, can still, you can still burn the fire in you, but then when you go down, and if somehow you don't reach the summit, then suddenly the, this big bubble is what's holding you up just deflate. And then suddenly all your energy just vanished. And that is why there is so much death on the descent, much more than on the, in the ascent. <coughs> and one of, actually my, one of my fellow climbers just tripped, and, and it was over. He tripped and he fell in a giant crevasse and uh, he was dead. At the time we didn't know that, we just know that at the end, when we were ready to proceed to a rescue and they're like, no, Sophie, forget it. He fell in a crevasse and he's already been buried by the snow because the wind is so, so high. 
So it just reminds you that never forget that you have to go down. You can not only think you're going, you're going up, you have to keep as much energy, energy to go down. And I think Road Peak is a perfect example because our go down, going down was everything but an easy peasy descent, if I may say. So here, that it's only, so what you do, you just go that way and then you keep climbing. That just, it's about 20 feet wall that you actually have to do some rock climbing with no rope, no rope. With only, you have your crampons, you have, you are like above, you know, you're almost at 26,000 feet, you are tired. Like now, we're climbing for over 15 hours. And you have to do this climb. And if you fall, then it's a straight shoot. So people are like, including me, we start sitting, considering like, you know, how do we feel? And uh, seven of us decide to go for it. So you do that, you cut this big rock, and then you go that way. But then you're not at the summit. Because Broad Peak is a tricky one. You have fake summits. What you do is once you arrive here, then you have to go down and up again to finally reach the summit. And that is a tough one. Because you just think of like, let's say on Everest, you're going up and then you're going down. On Nazi, you're going up and you're going down. On this one, no, no, no. You're going up and then you're going up and down and up and down and finally arrive to the summit. So if somehow the weather turned bad, then you are stuck. You cannot run going down. Nope, you have to just go back up and down and up and down to finally going down. So that is why it's, uh, it's, it's a tricky one. That is why I'm trying a lot of people say the summit brought big, but they didn't actually reach the actual summit, they reached only the fake summit. So the reach, um, you know, here on the east, like people here. You see? So we did like this four reach here. And the funny thing is, every single time, you see, there's a little peak. And to be honest with you, for me, they look pretty much all the same height. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're here. And they're like, no, next one. I'm like, okay. And I go to the next one. I'm like, yeah, we're here. And they're like, no, next one. I'm like, really? And it just goes on and on and on for hours. And finally, we reach it. We reach the summit. Put my prayer fly and uh, we celebrate. Start seeing some clouds, start seeing the weather changing. You see, here's a cloud and here's a, the good weather. That's a bad sign. You have to leave. The way down was a little bit tricky. Out of the seven climbers who actually summit Broad Peak that day with me, we all got dispatched. I ended up with uh, another girl, another climber girl, a German girl. And you have to see, like now you still see a little bit like what you can see what's going on, but then very soon it's gonna be dark. And the only thing you can see is what your handler, handland allow you to see. And that's gonna be it's become very tricky because you do agree with me with your handler, you here, you look here, and then you look here and you know, it's all snow and then a piece of rock, so it's very easy to get, actually get lost. And it's exactly what happened. Um, when we arrive at Camp Tree, so about 23,000 feet, up we are the first one. We log a 23 hour summit day, which is a pretty good time. Then two hours later, another group just came down, meet us at, the desk, at Camp Tree, and we're like, oh, what about, it's missing two, where are they? Where are they? And we're like, we don't know. They got lost. And that's a trick. It's now imagine yourself going up and down. You don't eat almost. You almost don't drink because drinking meaning you have to carry kilos because it's liters, so it's heavy. So you limit everything you can. And, you, and the worst is like you're so optimistic in your head, you just say, yeah, I'm going to do that in 20 hours. No, you don't. You do that in 30 hours. So how do you make up for those 10 hours? Well, you do not. What you have is you become exhausted, starving, thirsty, and the worst is you start, you know, the attitude start eating you up, and then you start having, like, you start illusioning, having illusions. So those two climbers, they were lost, but actually they were, they were very close to, the, to, to our base camp. 
uh, sorry, to our camp, but they couldn't, you know, they didn't know. After six hours of almost giving it up, you know, like you prepare yourself, okay, it's not gonna happen for me. Suddenly, the, one of the climbers realized he has a GPS on him, and he's finally plugged in and he's like, oh my God, and then he was, he was just here in two hours at camp. So they were safe. That is a river. I told you the, the weather changed. Before, it was we could just up, walk above it. After a month and a half, it became a giant, very powerful river that actually we, we, couldn't see, we could see the base camp. And you know the worst is, to the end, a summit, it's only a summit when you are back to base camp. And you could see, even touch the base camp, but you still have to cross this river. If you fall in this river, you are just washed out. It's so powerful and so cold, you, it's basically you, you die. So to the end, you have to face many different types of dangers. That night, not only you celebrate a summit, that night we didn't celebrate a summit. The very next day, the whole expedition split up. We just have this very bittersweet feeling. We, je we lost Jeff. Uh, those two guys were lost. It was just, just a bad night for everyone. So I was on my way to go. I was me and two other climbers, uh, two other that just went just to trek to see what was uh, K2 base camp, and I was going to climb K2. And we were going to K2 base camp, which is normally only a three hours walk from Broad Peak camp, base camp to K2 base camp, which is, according to everyone, is not a bigger deal. Well, guess what? If you just stuck in a snowstorm with zero visibility, you get lost. And we get lost. And we get so lost that we had no idea where we are. And we didn't even know if we were on the right glacier. Can you believe that? So this whole three hours turned out of a disaster of maybe 10 hours. And we were going down, passing all those like rivers for nothing. We finally, some, somehow, there was a tiny bit of visibility. And we were able to, we couldn't even see, get to anything around us. So whenever we were able to have a little bit of visibility, we could see where we are, and then we find, the, we find uh, K2 base camp. I had only 48 hours of rest. Um, I was psychologically, mentally, physically drained by this effort of my four seminars a month. And in two days, I was going to climb K2, one of the most dangerous climbs in the world. So. Um, <laughs> I was able to just find it in me. And what is interesting is if, you're not, if your mind is not in the game, don't play the game. That's an avalanche. No one even cares anymore. It's part of our decor, you know. The issue is this avalanche is actually the way we're going to go up. <laughs> so, as I did mention before, for the summer day to actually lower the probability to get caught in an avalanche is to climb by night is what you do. You start by night. Climbing K2 by night. So either I, I actually climb the session route. So you have different routes. Uh, the session route is a little bit more technical. It's a little bit more steep, straightforward. Uh, it's what I like. It's my style. I prefer all this vertical stuff. It's, uh, and uh, so the route is going to be like that, and like that, and like that. That's, that's the way we've been going. So we do climb, with, uh, we're going to start by night. Here, that's the flags. That would be important for the summit, because for the summit, there is this kind of plateau that you have the tendency to, to get lost easily. It looks like this big football field, but if there's a little bit lower, low visibility, you just get lost, and then that's a, you, you, you die there. So that's why we carry those, those, those flags, if you were wondering. So that's uh, this camp is over there, and then that we just not we halfway to camp one. We did a, our plan was doing a K2 speed ascent, um, which was skipping camp one, exactly like boat trip. So go straight to camp two, camp three, camp four, summit, go down. So the idea was doing the whole thing in five days, basically. 
pretty ambitious, I have to say. But um, everybody was feeling really strong, and we were a strong team. What is key for me at this time is we were only 10 climbers on the whole mountain. It's a giant mountain. Normally, it's full of expedition. That year, we were only 10 climbers to climb K2. So big disadvantage, once again, is we have to break the trail and carry everything. The big advantage is we are limiting the rock form and the ice form created by the other climbers. And that is when it's getting kind of important because that is a spicy traverse. And here it's spicy because here you have avalanche, rock fall, and then you start because you cannot move. And here you have to walk on those big rocks with like thin ice, and if you fall, it's a drop. So that's why it's a spicy traverse. That is our camp too. Our camp too it was it's pretty exposed. Here there's a big drop. And here on the top you have this roof. <laughs> Above you is like massive rock. And you think, my god, this thing's gonna just smash me. And you just you don't even know how they're holding. It's just unbelievable. And it was so exposed that we have to anchor our tent to the rock because the wind could just, you know just wiped out our tent and because we're so close to like here the drop then we'll just form. This tent here is my getting tent, it's that tent. It's a two person tent, single wall. That that I'm putting now, that is the stove I was talking about. And why is it important? It's because starting came to actually Lakpa, Louis with a German climber, and me happened to sleep three of us in this tent. <laughs> and what was very unfortunate for us is we were the rookie, so it was our first time on K2. So we had the total rookie treatment, which was uh, starting, <laughs> starting about three to four hours before anyone else, about the, you know, the versions like that, they could sleep, wake up, take a nice, you know, breakfast when it's warm. We have to wake up every day at 2 a.m., start the climb at, at 3 a.m. It was freezing cold and I get through and I got and I personally get cold easily. And then we have to break the trail and they were passing us finishing up the job and just every time take the best the best ten spot. And then we're like, really? So we always end up to be the last one. We be, we no more no more place to pitch your tent, you have to build something as you can. And uh, that's why we end up here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was just really tough, mentally. And the worst is like, we had to carry even more than anyone. So I think it's, it's little bit, uh, a little bit bittersweet on uh, my old K2 climb, but uh, it feels really great, this friendship we developed with Lakpa and, and Lois. That is the view from Kentu. That is actually, you, you remember when I told you, oh, which glacier are we? We don't even know if we are on this glacier or this glacier. <laughs> so, here that's a base camp of Broad Peak, and that is where we come from. That's a bunch of glacier. When you climb Kentu, there's a bunch of ropes. You just don't know where those ropes come from. So uh, you can either use it or leave it and do your climb. Uh, you take your own. You know, you take your own chance. That when we now we go into camp tree, we get we get in some attitude. We have to uh, walk on on edge, on edges, you know, on both sides. And then and then we that is uh, our camp tree. Oh. And that is our camp tree. Again, we try to <laughs> to anchor anchor the tent just to make sure she's the tent is not falling. You know. Uh, don't forget to train this tent, so we absolutely don't try to move too much either because we don't want to roll down the whole, uh, you know, the whole um, slide. That, it was, I think to me, personally, the most tricky aspect of it is, you know, uh, as we were starting first, and I hated it to walk on this type of rocks because the angle is very steep, and any rock 
you would make it loose can be fatal to one of the other climbers. So I, I really don't feel comfortable so much about that. But thankfully, we finally like reached some snow pretty fast, and uh, that is the way we were doing that day to reach to camp tree. That is actually a picture I took uh, from Broad Peak. And that is, that's, uh, that is when you are actually on K2. That's uh, 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 we here. So we go to camp four and we sleep and that's K2 and we get like, so that's a, you know, for Brookfield I was telling you, we're gonna pitch out flat there, then we're gonna climb and then we're gonna just reduce something. So, we could touch it, you know, there. And as usual, we have to start first. We were starting like, you know, early. And next thing you know, it was a whiteout. <laughs> and that is heartbreaking because that means your summit is over. And that means that you're not going to come get with this year. And uh, that's me being sad. <laughs> <laughs> being pretty sad, I found. Um, and then you go down. But look at that, it's not worth it. Uh, we just take some, we re rest. Um, keep going down. You just go down so fast. <laughs> it, takes, it takes like two days to climb up and then you just go, go down the whole mountains in a day. We arrived to camp two and the climber before us Two things happened. Actually, one of we actually lost contact with them, and we don't know what happened. We thought it was an avalanche. Uh, so, as I told you, like uh, around, like you remember, like the big picture with the big avalanche. That's really bad. That's in the afternoon. We were early afternoon. That came to. We decided to say, okay, that's it. We're not gonna take any chance. We're just gonna wait tomorrow morning. Better snow condition. Better consolidation. We're gonna go down to base camp. The other two guys, they said, no, we're gonna take a chance and. We lost contact with them. So we were, we saw they just die, you know. And the next thing you know, after a few hours, about eight hours, they end up to show up at base camp. And what happened is, it was not an avalanche. They didn't put an avalanche. They were going down, and the famous rope I was telling you, just be careful to it, broke. They just, they just fell and somehow stopped by miracle on a rock. Nothing happened to them, another miracle. And then stand up and you know put it together and go down to base camp. I know I guess the very next day, so we keep going down. That is actually famously from you know and they call it a chimney, so it's actually pretty narrow. It's a small couloir. Uh, we were still that's like, getting really rocky, so that actually came on. And that is me and my backpack. <coughs> my backpack was so heavy that I had to actually lean forward. Um, that you, it's what I climbed with in K2. So that was my adventure. So that is Broad Peak, view from K2. And that is K2, which we didn't submit. But that's OK, because my whole journey, my whole climbing journey, it wasn't not so much about climbing per se. You cannot be successful when you just focus only on the summit. You get overwhelmed by overwhelmed by, by the greed and your ego and your fear to fail yourself or fear to fail someone else. You have to actually be able to do it generally. <coughs> and that's why for me, Try four times to climb Broad Peak. It was not great. I did it because I could. I was just feeling good. And for me, not going going to the summit of K2. Well, I didn't do it because I couldn't. Because it was the weather was not there, and then we had to go because um, we had no more anything, no more food, nothing. <laughs> so, so with the last three months I spent in Pakistan. I end up to spend out of ninety days. I spend over. I spend eighty days over fifteen thousand feet. So fifteen thousand feet and above. 
That was my journey of climbing uh, Broad Peak and K2. Thing it's come from my childhood. I'm uh, I'm actually like the a very severe dyslex. I have very severe dyslexia, and uh, I could not express myself for the longest time. So I really find myself into music and actually into sport. And for me, sport is always been more than only sport. It's only it's been a way to express myself. And same as music, I could. Um, and um, why I chose so many different sports, it's uh, initially I was a tennis player and tennis, my friends, become my family. I become randomly in judo because I knew someone who did judo, you know it works. And uh, fencing was, I was, I was working on my school, school and uh, around 22 years old, I'm like, I want to be world champion of something. <laughs> And then I came up with this um, exclusive list. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do a ball sport because I did tennis. So no racket sport. I did a handball like that. So no ball sport, no, no basketball, no volley, it's over. I did judo, so done with the martial art. At the time, by the way, rugby, it's a true, true men's sport in France, which I didn't know we could play as a woman. In America, I've been told it was more like a women's sport. So I'm like, oh, okay, I can do it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, at 20, uh, age 22, I came up with her doing kayak. But I was at the time living in Paris, so it was, you know, not feasible. Sailing, which again, you know, not feasible. And then fencing. And to be honest with you, fencing, I didn't even, I never even saw in my whole life fencing. That was the whole point. And um, I, sh I, uh, I always believe that whatever your experience and expertise in life is not necessarily one time shot thing. It's you just carry on and you reuse it and you create synergy with, your, uh, with what you learn. And why I was suddenly so good in fencing, very fast actually, uh, with uh, basically I show up in fencing and they're like, like it was the beginners and they're like, oh, I'll come back tomorrow for the advanced and I show up at the advanced and I go, oh, I'll go back the day after for the competition. I'm like, okay. And three weeks later, I was this uh, champion of the whole like region of Paris and uh, three months later, as Beyonce said, I was able to, you know, uh, win the tournament to be selected for the World Cup and then I went to the World Cup. And, um, and it was a great adventure and for me sport it's really 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 a way of expressing myself when you climb for instance i use it as a self retrospection <laughs> uh, way i like thinking about me try to understand uh, what's going on in my own body uh, i'm i'm pretty intellectual i love thinking of how seeing of details and and uh, appreciating those things so basically if i'm Think I'm gifted in sport is only because I don't play sport, despite the fact I'm been successful, highly successful in sport. I don't, I, I don't compete against myself. I don't even compete for other people. I just m make it be alive, basically. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Um, okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, I wanted to, first of all, I admire you for uh, climbing. K2, I'm an armchair climber, and I know it's most difficult now in, in the world, just, just getting there is difficult. Did you use, I <coughs> did you use any sherbets 
No, you didn't. No. 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 So you did it on your own. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to say it's a matter of fact, uh, control, I think it's pretty unusual. Secondly, it, it, it is. It's. Um, no, it's. Our, um, I was basically. Uh, and maybe I, I, may, I was an independent climber and uh, I joined an expedition group who, who, but in my case I was just joining this expedition group <coughs> just to share the, the common good, which is the tent, the base camp. But I, I was independent, therefore I could come up with my own strategy, I was doing everything on my own. So whatever picture you saw actually, that's why it was so much harder for us because my big backpack as you saw, I was wearing two tents. It's it just... Uh, you know, I, I did it all by myself. <laughs> yeah, the second question. Who is your female climbing um, mentor? I don't. I, I have uh, no female mentor. I don't. Um, no female mentors? <sighs> no. No, no, no. Um, I actually have a, I have a rough time in the climbing community because uh, I just you know, I, uh, I don't look like a climber and I never even been a climber so much before. Um, you know, I was working in New York City, I, I was actually being a fencer and I just quit everything and to become a mountain climber. And, and I'm in my studies and a lot of people felt very uh, in competition with me. For many reasons, first of all, like if you always dream to climb and then someone from out of the blue show up and climbs, like what's wrong? That's, that's not fair. You know, you cannot do that. So that was that the first part was pretty bad. That was really mean to me. Then the second thing was those people in their 30s like me, they try to climb for years and they never really me to achieve something that they think was an achievement. And therefore that I was in direct competition with them. Because if I was successful, therefore me, it meant that they were not successful. So I actually end up having a great support among the 50 and above, the pioneer uh, climbers. And they were being very helpful. And I had a great support as well from a very young crowd, which more like the early 20s. The early 20s because they were full of hope and admiration and we were all on the same page, let's all do it and try to make something happen. And the older crowd was, well, you know, I already done it all. If I don't done it all, I already know I didn't do it all, you know. So it was a, so no female mentor and I, I think I end up to be more um, toward the, the 50 and above crowd uh, to actually find mentors and people were supporting me. Yes? I couldn't tell too well from the pictures. I was wondering, did you climb K2 without oxygen all the time? Yes. And, and if so, you, you did? Yes. Did you have any serious after effects from the thin no. air? No. Even up at 20? 6,000 feet and sleeping well? Uh, no. I, uh, I, that's the thing is, I, I just have this ability to, uh, you know, I, I don't even know why. And I don't know why I have this tolerance for altitude. Um, and I'm able to just go and climb, and I have videos of me, and I'm like that, like all smiley and very, uh, you would not even guess, like, I'm at 23,000 feet, and the day before I was at 15,000 feet, and a week before I was at sea level. So I, I don't have that saying that I didn't use oxygen because I don't need it. Uh, saying that, I never think I was like this super person. So I always carry oxygen in my backpack just in case because I think it just can happen at any time. So just in case, I would have, I would have, no, I would have no hesitation to plug the oxygen if I need it. I have n no problem with that. <laughs> yeah. Yes? A couple of questions. Uh, when you're not climbing a mountain or doing something extreme, but it's just an ordinary day, yeah. do you work out, do you go to the YMCA for a few hours or uh, anything like that? Uh, what's your daily routine? Well, actually, uh, do you have the internet here? Yes. I would show you a picture because I think it's very interesting. 
my own child, okay. when I quit my job, I was actually happened to be a, this investment banker and I was a fencer for the New York Athletic Club in New York. And I took, it took me six months at, on, from November to March. My only goal was putting on weight. I was in a fattening diet. So I actually had zero sport. Because if I was doing any sport, I would just burn because I burn very fast. So I was able to gain 30 pounds. And then I actually on show you and let's see, I lost my 30 pounds in seven weeks. <laughs> and that was the issue with me. It's actually it's interesting. My issue it's how to keep my body mass because I have a higher I I, I have more like this hyper metabolism. So it was a struggle. So after I finished climbing Lhotse, which is the first high thing in the world, I was in Kathmandu, and my only job was eating for one month. I was able to try to build up a little bit, and I was able to, to go to those climbs with a little bit more fat. The issue then after Keto, actually, in Pakistan, I got sick, and I lost lots of weight, and I, and I couldn't catch up uh, with, my, with my weight to finally, uh, you know, uh, fattening a little bit more and then I was able to go up. But for me, it's a huge challenge. And actually, fat is extremely good because fat's going to help you to, to keep, you, your, keep yourself warm. It's going to be a good food, you know, if you don't, if you start having not enough food anymore, you can start eating yourself, basically. So actually, fat is very good. But I, uh, so the answer is no, no daily routine. I was doing zero sport. Yeah. Because in my only purpose is to gain weight. Saying that, you have to see before that, you know, I, I was extremely athletic. I was fencing every day for a few hours, uh, every weekend for five, six hours. So I was extremely fit. So my, my problem was not the fitness aspect. It was really more like the body mass. I had to gain body mass. Which seems very funny problem for a lot of people, but it's actually very difficult to gain weight when you want to gain weight. <laughs> so, let me, yeah, a little technical question. Yeah. In general, yeah. did you use the ropes that you found on the mountain that were left by other climbers? I mean, did you trust the ropes? No. <laughs> no, I don't because, uh, no, I don't. I mean, sometimes they leave them on the mountains, don't they? They do. They come down. That's why you know one of the pictures, there yes. was a lot of ropes. A lot of ropes. And that the issue is, it, you know, you cannot play this game of like, okay, which one I'm going to take, and then yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you pick up the wrong one, you know? So it's sad <coughs> to find that only a climber judgment call, uh, I'd rather to just, because of my previous training, my two years training of, of strong alpine, I was able to feel comfortable dealing with rock and so no, I was not. I, I'd rather not use like old ropes. Yes. I understand you have a two-year-old daughter now, and you're yeah. writing children's books. And so I, I'd be interested to know what the message is that you're both giving to your daughter, and what the message is in those children's children's books. But also, I, second part is what's your next adventure? <laughs> Thank you for asking. Uh, well, my daughter, uh, when she was born, at two weeks old, I show her uh, MC Escher book, and it's those black and white drawing with a lot of like a more like a mathematical architectural pattern, and she was fascinated by it. And to me, it. I, I, I couldn't understand. And that, I think, that was a trigger. It was extremely counterintuitive. <coughs> and I think this counterintuitivity uh, puzzled me, and I started reading about it so, to try to understand what actually an uh, infant see, how does actually a baby brain works, and uh, what do they appreciate, and what are, uh, what are their abilities. <laughs> and so I, I, I wrote a book series based on baby cognitive development, what a baby can actually perceive and see and how to stimulate and engage a baby in hope to promote actually bonding but as well promoting like love of reading and, and eager to learn. So it was my book about. I've been successful with that. And my next challenge would be to, to actually uh, empower people and coach and speak and 
and uh, help people in not only in decision in their decision making, but mm, empower them to climb their own Everest. Uh, empower them to climb their own Everest. So that would be uh, my next challenge. What's your goal for your daughter? Oh, that the thing is, it's so funny because people think I'm an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it, that, that's very odd for me because for me, I just do things, you know? And I don't even think twice about it. And in my daughter, I, same thing, I don't really mind. She can do anything and do anything. I don't care <coughs> in a way that, um, I'm not like, uh, you know, try to just, you know, force things on her, you know, force the whole. I, I, I'm a big believer, believer in playing for a child is very important. I really believe in um, creativity and, and how uh, just let the, the baby brain develop in his, own, uh, in his own way. I just don't want to force too much on her. Like, you know, those flashcards is very popular now, like, you know, Okay, do your ABC flashcard, notice not to zebra is a lion and this kind of things. So I'm preschool for that. <laughs> yes? Is everybody in the family, in your family, the same, like overachievers? They are all your parents and things there. Is it No, I. Actually, it's very funny because I, my family, when I say I climb Everest, I, I just make it sound like, oh, I'm going to just buy a baguette, you know, it's kind of like really a big deal. And my mother was in Italy and I called her, you know, I summit Everest and she was saying to her friend, oh, my daughter just summit Everest. I'm like, what? What did you? And uh, I think they used to, you know, nothing really bothered them, not even, nothing impressed them, that's the thing. I mean, I just don't even say it, like when I was fencing, they didn't even know I was fencing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, did this work up? They're like, oh, really? So I'm like, oh, yeah. And then, you know. It's, I don't have that. I, we, my family, they just, uh, that's all, yeah, they know. And no one even do sports, my family anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, no one is even into sport period. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, uh, it's a uh, different game. <laughs> one more question. Will you continue to climb and do other extreme sports, not your mother? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really important. I mean, I see life in a, you know, kind of in book. You know, you have chapters. And I think it's very important, at least for me, to just close a chapter. It's healthy. It's, I just closed it and I just moved on. I have no regret closing it and I just love what I've done. But I do know the risk and I was able to do it because I had no responsibilities. Not, I was not married, I didn't have kids. It's a different thing, it's a different game. If you start climbing and you're not mentally there, if you start second questioning yourself and you start, oh, what if you at the wrong place? At least you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> Great. Well, we're